Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. You've heard their point, now, here's the counterpoint. Your host today is James Just, with guests Richard Fields and John Cameron. Now, here's James. Thank you all for joining us today. With me is Richard Fields and John Cameron. Gentlemen, California has... We've been talking about the Cal exit and the loss of California residents, but it's now kind of official. California has lost 182,083, to be exact, in 2020 alone. That's just in 2020. Not to mention we've lost a congressional seat and all the political ramifications of that. You know, the, after a decade of one-party rule, we're staring at the results. What do you think about that, Richard? Well, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of a nuanced uh, question because... The, the population res, uh, change or uh, loss is a result of a couple of different things. One is the, uh, the exorbitant cost of housing in California compared to other states. Uh, the second, you're looking at uh, the fact that uh, urban areas like the LA, San Diego basin, as well as San Francisco, don't really have any land available to build housing on, followed by regulations that make housing really, really difficult to build even if you do have land. And uh, it's interesting also that there's a, a net ingress of high-paid people to California, professional professionals making lots of money in Silicon Valley or, or, or other high-tech industries. Uh, meanwhile, it's the middle class and the lower classes that are being pushed out of California simply because they can't afford to live anywhere besides in an RV or on, in a tent on the streets, as we can see just by driving around our neighborhoods uh, or, or nearby neighborhoods. So, so it's it's a, it's a combination of economic factors, and then of course there's the the political factors. There's a huge number of people uh, in, particularly in the state of Jefferson, Northern California, uh, or other more rural parts of California that are that are sick and tired of dealing with the uh, the, the the regulatory environment and the political environment uh, in California. Not to mention the schools, the public schools, and they're getting out because they can, they want to. And there's a certain percentage of, uh, of high and or high income people that are saying, you know what, I don't need to pay the high taxes in California. It's not a it's not a, a large number, but it's a significant number when it comes to the the tax base in California. Elon Musk comes to mind and, and others uh, of his of his uh, uh, stature. I, I agree with the point. Did you? Sorry, James, you wanted to. No, it's just it's just the. End result of a decade of political landscape. It seems I was reading the articles on this, and we seem to go all the the news media seems to go out of their way to avoid discussing the political landscape of California, which underpins literally everything Richard just talked about. The political landscape of California is the root cause of all these problems, and they abjectly refuse to talk about it. Hmm. And that's kind of what I've just find amazing. Well, and then the. the the, all the articles, the there's L.A. Times article, and it was saying, oh, it's it's you know, basically we have high income people coming out, and the people who are leaving are middle income or you know lower income. So it wasn't said, but it's like the the if you read it, the feeling you were supposed to get, well, this is okay because rich people are moving in. Well, what what it and then one of the other articles I looked at talked about. Uh, the, the loss of businesses, you know, listed a net loss of 1,100 businesses moving out of California, but 5,716 businesses started in California. So, you know, all of the, all of the news basically is sand, slanted to saying that numbers are there, but they're really not bad. But what, what the numbers don't say is that the, the businesses that are leaving California or existing businesses – Starting businesses fail at, at an alarming rate. Uh, and Sacramento, once again, I, th I don't know if I've seen the official numbers for, uh, for 2020, it was always at the top of the list for the hardest place to start a new business. And California in general is always at the top of the list of the hardest place to start a new business. And allegorically, I can tell you a guy I know from a club I belong to, uh, who is a financial, uh, you know, planner, advisor. And he had, uh, not that many years ago, he had zero clients out of the state of California. And now he has state, he has clients in 16 states. And many of these are, shocker, uh, retired public employees 
who have sucked the marrow out of the economy of California and have left so that there are huge California pension uh, payouts that they get are not taxed at the highest personal income tax rate in the country. So, um, you know, these are all, despite what the article says, these are all high wealth people who are taking the equity out of their overpriced houses that are overpriced because of scarcity and uh, taking their wages that, that uh, their retirement, their obscenely high retirement that would otherwise be spent providing goods and services in California and moving to places in the country that they're treated more favorably. And if you, if you just want to do some common sense looking at this, um, just drive by Incline Village in Nevada, you know, which is close enough to California where people can get here pretty quickly if they want to, but just on the other side of the border, so people there pay Nevada taxes, not California taxes. And, uh, and another little kind of uh, straw on the, on the already broken camel's back, I was talking to a developer who was trying to blame uh, the, uh, the uh, bad uh, state of California schools on Proposition 13, and apparently he didn't know that the state of California is getting $74 billion in property taxes, um, which is way, way, way more than, you know, based on the number of increasing students that, that it should be getting based upon uh, normal uh, inflation. And, and he was talking about New Jersey and other places where they have uh, higher um, uh, real estate taxes, higher property taxes. And he didn't seem to grasp the idea that one of the reasons you can have such inflation in house prices here is because those houses aren't marked to the market. If you're a retired individual living in a house that you bought 30 years ago, unless your retirement keeps track of inflation, if you were paying 3% or 4% property tax or two and a half even or three on a mark to the market house, which should probably cost about $300,000, but actually now sells for a million, it would be very hard for you as a retired person to pay your property tax alone, much less put food on your table and pay for gas and all the rest of that. So just the, the lower property taxes here allow the inflation and in house prices as long as those property taxes aren't marked to market. So there's lots and lots of factors that support it. And uh, yeah, it's there's one. Yeah. Go ahead. And one other factor as well, which is a, a federally induced factor, which is the uh, slowdown in immigration. California is a, a yeah. massive net immigration state from uh, Mexico, and that's that's been slowed. And so we're seeing an interesting uh, thing happening. We're seeing people who would normally be uh, against inflation or against the immigration saying, well, maybe we need more of it in order to avoid uh, losing a congressional seat. It'll also be interesting to see uh, how gerrymandering takes place once the uh, districts are redrawn to uh, uh, compensate for the fact that we, we have one less representative from the state of California. Well, I think state of California having one less represented is a wonderful thing. I think if they had about 50 less, because, uh, you know, they, they, they keep talking uh, about national elections and, you know, the popular vote is never, uh, never in favor of, but then you've got the electoral college and we should get the electoral college. But what, what, if you factor in the automatic gimmies in national elections of the state of California and New York, uh, a, a middle of the road, uh, or conservative uh, presidential candidate is going to find a, a, a tough time ever capturing the uh, the, the 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 popular vote, um, and uh, that's as it should be. Our founding fathers were pretty smart when when they set up the electoral college because you know the idea is that, uh, and also the senate, the, the senate. You know the idea is that you don't want uh, crazy California imposing its will on. Rhode Island or Idaho or the rest of that. Um, and uh, so it makes a lot of sense, but uh, it's it's never portrayed that way in, in the press. I'm, I'll be really interested in that, the, the gerrymandering that's going to go on. 
I know James has some some knowledge in that area that I didn't. Yeah, well, Maybe I was. Speak to it. Well, I was part of the process, the first few rounds of the pro, the last process to choose the redistricting commission. I went to right like round four before they released the list of terms that the commission had to work under. And essentially, the commission doesn't get to decide how to draw the districts. Not really. The boundaries are told you have to, to have to bring into account things like race and economics and all various types of factors that are essentially a Democrat wish list of how to draw a district. If you wanted a Democrat wish list of how to draw a district, you, you, it's what you've got. Rather than what a normal human being would want and say areas of common interest, natural boundaries, you know, freeways, rivers, you know, big major streets or natural boundaries. But that's not how they draw it. They draw it based upon factors that are purely political. And you're going to end up the same way. It's not going to change. We're going to end up, just look at the map. <laughs> All you have to do is look at a map and, and notice that we're still gerrymandered to say, oh, heck. And so yeah, the commission at, didn't solve anything. Just look at the map. And at the way that uh, uh, South Orange County, or the, the, the district that encompasses much of South Orange County, um, and they wanted to make sure they captured all of the quasi-conservative or middle-of-the-road voters in, in that part of Southern California. So it's... it's uh, You'd be hard pressed to actually identify that when you looked on a map. You go, "What?" And uh, it's it's pretty it's pretty clear that it's it's designed to to give greater representation to the people who are who are in power and uh, keep those who are out of power uh, from ever gaining power. It's it's you know that's that's its only reason. There's a reason so many people run essentially unopposed. It's it's because these these are. Uh, these districts are completely gerrymandered to suit the party in power. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's just the way it goes. But speaking, you talked about Sacramento earlier. The Sacramento mayor and city council got a pay raise, John. You know me, we're still here. We still here live in Sacramento. We gave our uh, city council and our mayor a pay raise because uh, apparently other city councils around the area pay their people more. So they clearly deserve more money. Well, actually, the the list. I, I'm glad you said that. It looks like Richard just dis, uh, disappeared. I'm, I'm I'm hoping he'll be back soon. Um, the the in the article that I read about it that you were kind enough to provide for. There he is. He's, uh, he's on on the far right of my screen, which is appropriate, I think. Um, Every thumb. The uh, uh, cities they listed were all super high cost cities. It was San Jose and Seattle and San Diego and all the rest of that. They didn't list Modesto, Stockton, Fresno, uh, any places like that, you know, uh, your cities in Tennessee or in South Carolina or other places where, where their, their uh, cost of political chicanery might actually be lower. They, they picked comps that were, um, Pretty high, high cost places to do business or even dirty deeds, which is what the government does. So it's it's very interesting in even assessing their own pay. They didn't look at comparable cities uh, in size. They just picked the most expensive, uh, high cost labor cities they could find and compared themselves to that. So yeah, and they create a yeah. citizens commission for all this. But of course, everybody on the citizens commission is a friend of. So it's. <laughs> <laughs> you know, how is that? A, it's a friend of somebody. So, you know, if I, I hadn't realized I hadn't realized how much they paid those people. Uh, and is is that supposed to be a full time job for those people? Or is that just uh, uh, well, you could you you know way more about the politics than I do, James. Yeah, I haven't. Um, I stay out of try to stay out of city politics. Yeah. It drives me absolutely crazy, even though it's and, just yeah. down the street from my house. Yeah, no, it's, it's a, most of the you know city council mayor. Most of those jobs are essentially ceremonial. They'll go around and shake hands and, and come to a, uh, the city council meetings once a week or whatever it is. But it's no, it's not a full time job unless the city councilman wants to make it a full time job and perish the thought that they do. We would rather have them, you know, be sitting on their bus and coming up with uh, more stupid regulations. So, mm. no, it's not a full time job unless they want to be uh, bigger mischief makers than they already are. Mm. And only, only, uh, only in politics can the workers set their own salaries in effect, and that's exactly what's happening. Well, and, 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 and virtue signal, and virtue signal while they're doing it. Look at what a great job I'm doing. Wow. Mm. 
Yeah, yeah. but they're not doing a great job. Our cities okay. are, are in shambles. The roads can't get filled with potholes. The, these development projects, I live on Stockton Boulevard. There's a handful of development projects going on. And you go to these meetings, and it's like going to a, oh, a timeshare sales pitch. You know, it's just awful. It's, you're going here. It's like he's already made the decision. It's just mm. you're just sitting here. It's it's the definition of uh, manufactured consent. I used to not buy into that manufactured consent thing until I've gone to some of these city meetings where they're trying to plan these. And I don't care. Let them build their little development. I'm okay with it. It's just God. It's just so dirty. I needed a shower when I come home from these things. It's mm. gross. Well, hold on. If it's like a timeshare, <laughs> you at least get a free gift like a bicycle or a pontoon boat or something like that. For well, if you're attending or or not. Well, you, John, you if you're know, politically you connected, attention. they will throw you bones. They will throw you money. They will yeah. give you, you know, you you pretend to file a lawsuit. They'll settle the lawsuit and give you your and give you some uh, and give you some gifts. It's what happens. Okay. It's, you know, it's the nature of the business. Because I could, been, you know, I could sit through a timeshare pitch as long as I got like a bicycle or a trip to Hawaii or something like that. But if I just got to sit there and go home and take a shower, I'm not doing that. I I can take a shower without going to a meeting. Yeah, uh, yeah you know, I'm trying to save water here. I don't need more than one shower a day. That's all I'm saying. Well, so after you attend one of those meetings, you might need two or three. You know, oh, that stuff's yeah. sketchy. That stuff's sketchy. Yeah. Oh, it is. It's gross. Um, the Pro Act. Here in, I actually had an interview with the art with the with the author the other day, writing an article about the Pro Act gig workers, mm-hmm. and we now have a, it's continuing the assault on gig workers. What they did with AB five here in California and the the disastrous results of that, they now want to take nationwide because apparently messing with workers in California isn't good enough for these people. They want to destroy the lives of people nationwide. I, mm-hmm. you know, I don't even understand it. It's how can they view what happened in California? How can they can talk to gig workers, freelancers, people like myself, sit there and screaming at the top of our lungs, we don't want what you're trying to force us into, and that they say, ah, but we're doing it for your own good. Hmm. Uh, they're, they're, I, James, I know you've been in politics for a while, but this is a lesson that sounds like you still haven't learned here. They're not doing it for the good of the people. They're doing it for the good of their major supporters, which are unions. And the more people who are classified and for their for their tax base, because uh, countrywide and probably worldwide, gig workers pay uh, on the same amount of income because of the expenses that they can declare as which they're all taxpayers should be able to write off medical expenses and all the rest of that stuff. But they can't. Um, you can only write off, I think, medical expenses. They're over nine percent of your AGI. And that's that's a big chunk of money. Um, what they want is uh, more unions so they can get more donations uh, from unions because unions support government. They want, um, they, I think they actually want fewer uh, uh, self-employed people because self-employed people vote libertarian or conservative or at least fiscally conservative, maybe not socially conservative. And um, so they have they they really don't care about you at all. Uh, they never have. They never will because gig workers uh, consistently don't vote for the people who are setting the rules. So the fewer of those gig workers they have, the more votes they're going to get from union members. And, the, the, and I mean, Ronald Reagan said it perfectly when he said, "The scariest statement in the world is I'm here from the government and I'm here to help you." Hmm. And see, here's the thing about this whole union issue. If the unions had come to the gig workers and said, hey, what problems are you facing and maybe we can help, and got sat down at the table and figured out a way, they could have actually had a whole chunk of gig workers willing to join unions. But that's not what they did. They came in and said, here's what you're supposed to want, and we're going to force it down your throat whether you like it or not. And, and then they wonder why we resisted it. It's just, it's just mind-boggling that these, these people are that actual dense. <laughs> and it's uh, and when you look at gig workers and the definition of, um, I don't know how f- familiar you guys are with the in- the insurance industry. Uh, the insurance industry is one of the most highly regulated and controlled industries there is. What you can say to people, what paperwork they have to have, the sales process you go through, and all the rest of that. If anybody should be uh, uh, employees is all these people who are end of quote unquote independent contractors who work for insurance companies and other financial entities. Super highly regulated. Every step of anything other than your marketing 
And even in your marketing, you can only say and send certain very, very particular things which have been approved by the organizations you work for and, and say those particular things. But those people are not and will never be classified as employees. Why do you think that is? Because the insurance companies have huge political clout and they give huge donations to politicians. So they will never fall under the category of employees, even though by definition, when you look at who's self-employed, if you're self-employed, you're supposed to have control over your hours, control over your, your means of doing business, control over your business, control over your communication, uh, control over all the rest of that. And if you look at the very job title of an insurance sales and marketing, financial product sales and marketing, you will find that about 3% of their time is under their own, own control and 3% of the communication. So flat out, you just know that, they, that, that, that there's no connection between what they, they count as what an employee should be and gig worker, other than the fact that gig workers don't have political clout, so they can force them to be employees, whereas insurance salespeople have huge political clout, so they can't. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so let's talk about California again, some more uh, immoral behavior on California. Millions are stuck in the child support system of California without actually helping the families. And we've seen this time and time again where the father is forced to pay a, a – gets initially put a, an amount, a child support amount that is completely unreasonable. He cannot force to pay it. Then by the time you get a, a hearing six months later to get it put down to a reasonable amount, then you're now six months in arrears and you've now become a deadbeat dad simply because the courts and the system has completely ignored the realities of economics. They, they want you know, these families to pay money they simply don't have, and then they don't even give all the money they pay to the kids. They take half of it. So if you have a $500 child support, you pay it to the government, the government then gives $250 to the, the other parent and keeps $250 to repay child uh, welfare. Which of course is just kind of goofy. So it's, I just hope this whole thing is immoral. It's it's and it's one of these things that Kamala Harris, our new vice president, had a strong hand in putting together. It, it's yeah. I mean, the thing about about uh, child support and uh, the breakup of marriages in general is that uh, when people have children, they're taking on a really really important responsibility. And the two people involved in creating children should accept that responsibility. And it should take place in a non-coercive environment. In other words, there should not be a situation where the state gets involved and says one person is more at fault or one person is more responsible, et cetera. The state should not really be involved in uh, divorce proceedings. In fact, the state should not be involved in marriage proceedings. In fact, the state never was involved in marriage uh, proceedings until the anti-miscegenation laws in the uh, back in the in the uh, in the nineteenth century. And if you don't know what that is, those were the laws that required people to get a license to get married in order to prevent races from mixing, in order to prevent blacks from marrying whites. In the, in the Jim Crow era. That's the cause of the whole uh, family law problem. The fact that we have licensed marriage shouldn't be licensed. It should be a voluntary uh, association. And if it's a voluntary association and not uh, affected by tax law, not affected by all of the other uh, marriage law things that have been that have come into place as a result of licensing, you wouldn't have the situation that you have right now. You'd have a situation where men and women, husbands and wives, who decide they don't want to live together any longer, would be able to, between themselves, come up with a, uh, a solution that does not involve the government taking a, a ransom, taking a cut off the top of who gets uh, who, you know, money that should, in fact, go to the kids. The second uh, problem that we're looking at uh, with this whole family law situation is that the, the, the government charges a 10% penalty on so-called deadbeat dads or moms, as the case may be, and that 10% adds up really fast, particularly in a 0% interest world. Somebody that's making twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 a year can't afford a 10% uh, tax. And once that, once that starts hitting, there's no way of getting out of, the, uh, out of that vicious circle. 
and it, it's it's a it's a, a system that works not for kids, not for fathers, not for mothers, only for uh, child protective services and the and the, uh, the the court system and the people that administer it. Well, I want to add to what what Richard said that if in in if it wasn't if the outcomes weren't happening that are happening, which is you know one of the first things they do is suspend people's driver's licenses. So they you know in California, with very few exceptions, you need a car to have a job. Uh, you can't depend on public transport, nor nor should we. I'll be private transport. So you know if if the court uh, really wants people to have the ability to pay these court mandated child support payments, they should maybe provide a car to somebody so they can have a job. And then the income stream would be there. The idea that, that people who get welfare, you know, call it welfare, should pay it back, I think is a pretty good idea. But why in, in, in one case, does the government want to take some of the money that it's throwing at people, and these are supposedly needy people, or else they wouldn't have thrown the money at them, and get it back from them if they have the ability to pay it back later, where they don't do that in any other area. The people who are being punished are inordinately people of color, and we're supposed to be trying to help people uh, who are, are at the, who have, you know, been downtrodden for a long time. But the net effect of this law, just like Kamala Harris's other laws, you know, the drug laws that she enforced, like the Gestapo and all the rest of that, most affect the people that the people in power are now saying they want to help. So we can once again pretty much take it to the bank that what the government says is the reason for doing what it's doing is, is completely disassociated from its actual reason. Yeah, the original, we're just about out of time, but the original um, reason for creating the system was you had upper middle class and upper class men who were ignoring the responsibility and you said, well, we need to create a system to force them to take responsibility. And fair enough, but we, then we take that system and we impose it on the poor and those people are still getting away with not taking care of their kids. It's, they haven't even solved the actual problem. All they've done is destroy a bunch of families. It's, just, it's all they've done. But their, their spreadsheet at the end of the year looks great. It looks great. It looks like, hey, look, we have many cases we've settled, how much money we've collected. Look at us. We're good. And the reality is they're destroying lives over and over and over again, and they don't seem to care. That's all the time we have. Thank you, gentlemen, for being with us today. Thank you guys for watching, with, watching us. You can visit us at libertariancounterpoint.com. We're rebuilding the website. And from all of us here, please remember to love everybody. Thank you, James. Thank you, James. I really appreciate the offer. Thank you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint. Listen each week in Sacramento on Comcast Channel 17 for Knuckleheads of Liberty on Monday at 5.30 p.m. and the Libertarian Counterpoint show on Thursday at 8 p.m. Also on YouTube, Facebook, and podcasts everywhere. Please visit us at http colon slash slash www.libertariancounterpoint.com. We invite you to come again next week for the Libertarian Counterpoint Shows.